Adam Parfray is the mastermind behind Feral House, a publishing company that is known for its risky and celebrated nonfiction books from the late 1980s. I guess I became aware of them around uh, the early 90s and through bookstores like uh, the Amok Bookstore and uh, just friends that would sh you know, show me some of these, these incredible books. And uh, we have Adam Parfray with us, the publisher and editor and also a filmmaker with us tonight. Adam, welcome to the show. Thank you, Terry. Can you tell me a little bit how you you you, you sought this kind of um, style of genre of books? You know how you how you sort of fell into this kind of uh, this work. We started in the eighties, uh, the mid eighties, and I didn't have money then, but I was able to convince this guy who had a a stat house, you know, that place that makes half tones and stats. Oh yeah. Earlier when the, the kind of software and uh, stuff you have now to create books and other things, he liked my ideas. We were introduced by a, a friend of mine, Joe Jandine, who's an illustrator. So he liked the ideas of the books, and then we thought about what we wanted to publish and so on. So we started to inquire whether about different projects, whether we were able to uh, get the rights to them for publishing purposes and didn't have that much money. So we're really low in the barrel there. Right. And so, you know, you go, we, we started inquiring then. We started inquiring the bigger publishers. You know, they were noticing that they're probably the books that we wanted were interesting. They reprint, they started reprinting the ones. So we act, acted as a, a moderator oh. to the interesting level of their books. So there are various things that came back in print, like Daniel Mannix and uh, William Lindsay Gresham mm -hmm. and, uh, and all that stuff. But then I was doing research for a, a magazine I was going to produce, uh, like, you know, Xerox style. Oh, just like sort of like a, fa like a fanzine kind of thing. Ah, uh, like a zine style. Yeah, thing. a zine, yeah. yeah. And the stuff I was collecting for that eventually became apocalypse culture. But the guy involved in the writing was so remarkable, his attitude and his writing style, and it blew my mind. This guy named James Shelby Downard. And he did a piece called King Kill 33, and uh, and and that had a whole different perspective on interpreting news stories or public stuff. So I thought, and, and and so it blew my mind. Why wouldn't it blow anyone else's mind? And it did. So I included that in that first edition of Apocalypse Culture. And as far as the other stuff, there was stuff that was, wow, this is very striking, crazy, extreme stuff, and you can't find it anywhere. There was no yeah. Internet. There was nobody really knew about some of the stuff I ran across, ran across and then put in that book. It, it was just a different process. People got, you know, are getting pretty lazy about it. They think that everything is on the Internet. Right. So they just do a Google search and think that's it. And I tell you, it is not. <laughs> and uh, there's an extraordinary amount of stuff that people aren't looking at. Uh, people don't realize that. They think yeah. it's, if it's not in the Internet, it's not anywhere. And now I live in the same town as uh, Mike Hoy and the Lumpanics used to operate out of in uh, Port Townsend, Washington State. Now, is that, and, by, uh, is that by design or is it just a coincidence that you happen to be there? It's both a coincidence and not the... My sister had moved up here. The reason for that was that we put out a book through my other publishing company called Process, Process Media, and it was about getting out, about becoming an expat. Hmm. My sister has, has a uh, Brazilian husband, so that became an issue. Hmm. And um, so she was going to visit uh, British Columbia up here in Canada, uh, drove through Port Townsend, liked it enough to move here, and so I came up and visited her, and I and I found a a place that was kind of on the down low, but I could use it both as a house and an office. So I thought that was, and I, I liked the area quite a bit. Is so it, I, I moved here too, from LA, with um, 
my wife at the time. So are you um, – yeah, I actually lived in L.A. for like 20-something years and then like for a couple of years in San Francisco as well. But it's so funny like how many people I know that are like, uh, like our friends are artistic and in, in uh, publishing that, that have moved, moved to Port Towns and it must be – it must be quite the mecca. I've, I have yet to go there, but everyone tells me I would absolutely love it. Your involvement with um, the book that inspired uh, the Tim Burton, Ed Wood movie. No, what was that? What was the name? No, of that? That... Nightmare of Ecstasy. Nightmare of Ecstasy. Yeah. How did that come about for you? Well, I was introduced to this guy, Rudolph Gray. He was doing a lot of research, and he didn't have a computer, so he was like typing up a lot of... Uh, interviews he did and um the, there's a lot of extraordinary stuff about this unusual director who you know i, I found fascinating ed wood at the time and nobody really done anything about him yeah but um yeah was he the worst filmmaker of all time this like these golden turkey award books say yeah. i didn't think so right <laughs> yeah but it so and neither did the um, the guy who did the interviews really. He thought he was getting short shrift and all that stuff. So we, um, you know, and it was also a, a kind of a sleaze book writer and hmm. did a lot of that kind of stuff, sort of uh, really down and out, lower level Hollywood area. And that's fascinating in a way because I grew up with a character actor, uh, father and i always went to the sets with him and saw the, the things being filmed and so on was so it's um is your father of anybody we would have we would recognize or no you, you might recognize him there's a lot of stuff his name is woodrow parfrey hmm. so just look up on just google it okay so he would take you around to different uh like i guess on, on his different shoots and stuff and you sort of i mean were you fascinated by that kind, that side of Hollywood, the uh, behind the it's ordinary to me, actually. Yeah, I mean, it was nice to take me to the set, and people were nice. It was interesting seeing things uh, being shot uh, on these episodic TV shows and stuff. And uh, we sometimes we went out on uh, location movie shoots, and that was fun. But I, it was it was familiar to me all that stuff. Well, almost, because I wasn't really familiar with that grade Z Hollywood stuff yeah. until uh, later in life. Not as a kid, though. But um, what was interesting about that project was that, you know, I, I'm in a business now of book publishing. Mm -hmm. And that it, it, this always becomes a problem where we publish books. And people say, well, what, I've never heard of this guy. Who, who, who the hell is Ed Wood anyway? And, and, well, he did all these films that people thought were the worst movies of all. Why would we be interested in that? <laughs> and I couldn't get any orders originally. <laughs> and uh, But it just happened to get uh, some good reviews, some like a full page in Time magazine and stuff, and then... Then I got calls from uh, people who wanted the rights to a Tim Tim Burton, and then the writers who wrote that uh, wanted that too, and it was their first thing they had written. And they've written other stuff like the uh, movie about Larry Flint, and now they're doing a movie about oh about Keen Walter Margaret Keen, the yeah. big eye painters, and I wrote a feature story about that that was reproduced quite a bit and pretty familiar in the 90s was it called it was um, citizen keen yeah I, i'm looking thing. i'm i'm yeah. looking at it right now on my bookshelf i have a actually i'm one of those i'm one of those people that has an entire shelf on my bookshelf right here of uh of feral house books and i'm, I'm I, and i know i'm not the only one because I, i'll run it like in fact i was just at a convention in los angeles at the monster palooza convention and uh i there was like two people i ended up talking to and they were talking about um i haven't got it yet but they were talking about some of the black uh the black metal books that are coming out and the, i guess you guys have a black metal book and um yeah and so i you know 
it was just so cool, you know, because going back to the Ed Wood book, I remember taking that book and going around Los Angeles whenever there was an, a location or an address mentioned in the book and just just hanging, you know, just trying to track places down. Sex and Rockets, that was another one that I could go into Pasadena, try, you know, going down Orange Avenue, Orange Boulevard, looking for the mansion, stuff like that. I just, I was really into that. And I, I started wondering, like, how difficult it is what you did, especially when it comes to marketing, just like what you said to someone said, why would we want to do a book like that? We don't know who this is. And also, like, the fact that there's, it costs so much to market, or at least it seems to me, to market something. It seems like it costs so much money. But if you could find some subject that that a, a small cult of people were interested in, that you you would almost ha you would almost save yourself a little bit uh, in marketing because it would be the subject that would sell itself almost. But that I don't know. That's probably not even correct, is it? Well, that's not really how it all works. Uh, and and it's kind of a dull topic hmm. too. But it's um, like you know how how to market things, how to call attention to it. Yeah. These days it's different from what it was before. There's no real book reviewers per se now. Yeah. And so that on, and then you know, and then a lot of the stores that used to have a lot of our books, sort of like. Uh, Amazon, uh, not Amazon, a uh, tower. Yeah. Tower boat orders. Yeah. That's out of business. And and earlier on uh, in the 90s, borders had a much better selection, and there were they had a lot of stuff, and they were trying to sell themselves. We carry everything, kind of uh, yeah. bookstore. Yeah, I remember. But, I remember. Uh, Going, I remember going to um, to Borders. At, I, I actually, I think I remember. Well, I definitely used to go to Tower and get zines, and uh, and I did like you know, f what was that fact sheet five that used to come out? I used to, I used to collect those, and you just you don't see. Well, fact five was great it, they would they would tell you about you know they would review every single book we did, so people would know it exists, yeah. and people the kind of people would be interested in our books would read. Fact sheet five. Yeah. So that was really good. the closest these days is like boing boing. Maximum Rock also did that um, for us. Well, I want to get into some of the the stuff that you're doing now because um, it was I, I watched someone sent me a video link to a thing about chemtrails and um, I'm right now I'm living in Tennessee. We moved out here, so I, I wanted to be able to grow my own food and try to be off the grid as much yeah. as possible, but. Um, I, I was out mowing today. Uh, we got we got like, you know, like five acres, and and I'm mowing this one section. And I look up the sky, and the sky is just clear blue. But these jet trails are all like you know crisscrossing the whole sky, and um, yeah. I, and I I actually didn't even get to finish the um, the, the video, but I, I really find it hard that there's not something to it. I try not to be, but I mean I I know like people that are you know, way more intelligent than I am. And, and there's a lot of them. <laughs> and uh, and they seem to think that there's something going on. So, I mean, um, and I, I know that you guys well, have... Sir, yeah. It has to do with intelligence level, yeah. whether there's a recognition of this situation. But, um, yeah, we have a book uh, that's at the printer now uh, on the subject of chemtrails and this thing called HARP, which is an ionospheric... Uh, military device or weapon, and then there's it's not the military industrial stopped and started. Uh, there's a history of geoengineering, mm. and you can look it up. Uh, and the geoengineering, it's there was a lot of these experimental aerosols where they, you know, these planes would drop aluminum and other type of. Uh, heavy metal things and dispersing it in the in the skies and and then that's supposed to have stopped in the 70s but you know military industrial got larger not smaller and they're not stopping their procedures so it's like it's ridiculous to think that yeah this is, uh, weather is now a war weather wars yeah and 
they would not be doing their job if they were not investigating that and doing that stuff. It's, it's the way it is. But the thing is, is that even very intelligent people, and particularly them, they don't want to believe that it, that is a reality. And then they will, will ridicule people uh, to saying that it isn't. But what, I, I, you know, I, I don't really care whether these people admit or agree or know this or this, but the, it's all, you know, they don't want it to be the truth. So there's a lot of lashing out, a lot of hostility. Yeah. And I've already got a lot of hostile posts and, uh, by, you know, people who don't want that book and think you're fucking mad that that's such a thing. Yeah. I, so, I, um, yeah. you know, I post a lot of stuff. I mean, things that I'm interested in. And I, I you know, I am interested in. I mean, I guess all basically every subject you guys cover. I mean, I'm I'm interested. I'm inter interested in a lot of things, but I'm also um, I post a lot of UFO stuff, a lot of military, a lot of of top secret kind of things. And um, every time I post it, uh, someone's always quick to, you know, make fun of it. I mean, it, it's just like, of course, I I know basically with Facebook, you know, being able to be the person that comments with the funniest joke is the thing but there does there's so much ridicule and discounting of you know it's i i would i always wondered if if i did have an you know an alien abduction or an alien sighting or even if i witnessed some um military aircraft that no one had you know you know that hasn't been released to the public i, I don't know if i would ever tell anybody because you know it just the, just the reactions i get when i'm posting to other people's information is you know it's painful well yeah it, it, it's it, what it is is I, what i think happened is the internet stage everybody's sitting sitting alone in their building and they want to feel important and they want to feel smarter yeah and people have uh, mental problems mental issues yeah. they feel i think People feel pretty low and disturbed that they just can't do much with their life. People who are doing things with their life, they're not fooling around with internet comments all the time. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess they so. Have better, they have better things to do. Yeah. I was really enjoying the work of, uh, and still do, uh, uh, of Crispin Glover. And I know, I, I think, I may not be sure, but I thought, I think you you may have had something to do with what is it, like the, did you have anything to do with the publishing of the the little book that came out with that? Or um, No, that's, no, that's Crispin's thing. Okay. All his little book. I did have a lot to do with the film, however. Okay. That he made, the what is it. And that came about after we were both discussing uh, we saw that Forrest Gump movie, mm -hmm. and we both really disliked it <laughs> yeah. for a number of reasons. <laughs> That's number. Al it's always good to hear. I always like hear. I don't know why, but that makes me happy when I hear that. <laughs> well, and so we were talking. We, you know, he's a good friend. And we were talking about what we didn't like and why that happened and what this Hollywood thing is and all that and how to, how to deal with it. And so. Uh, I thought one of the things is that why can't, why couldn't Hollywood just film Down Syndrome people yeah. or whatever the scump was supposed to be rather than make it a, like a star flight thing for a, for a celebrity yeah. to pretend to be a pretend retard. Yeah, which, it, that's sort of sick. Yeah. I, it's just like it's Gets away from the reality of it, gets into this whole actor as celebrity, as star, and what, you know, then it's like Tom Hanks, and <laughs> it, it's not about the the story even, it's just, it's just building up a false, falsity that we really disliked. Uh, I, I, when I, I remember coming out of the theater, and I, I sort of felt, I, in, in a way, that the movie was almost like, um, 
you know, it was almost like putting on blackface. You know, it was almost like doing a minstrel show, but instead of race, it was, uh, you know, a mental condition. And uh, and also, I, I know I can't help but think this. I, sometimes I think that that is what the government wants us to be. They want us to be simple. They want us to be slightly retarded and be happy with what what they allow us to have. Well, you mentioned that it's kind of a minstrel show type of thing. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's what I played in the movie, a minstrel. Mm. Oh, that's, yeah, okay. Uh, Christmas movie of it. So yeah. that was part of the scene of it. You know, back in the day, uh, I, I in in fact, I used to do some casting. On, I, I did help a little bit of a casting on it for a movie studio, and uh, I, every once in a while, you know, I would do what I could to try to get Crispin's dad uh, in in in. in uh, we just sat down and talked. I thought I thought he was like a really interesting guy, and uh, and I I've never met Crispin in person, but I, I've gone to his. Uh, when when his books came out back, I guess that was back in the early '90s or whatever. I'd go and see some of his, you know, his talks or his performance of that kind of stuff. I always thought that that was a really interesting family. And uh, did you have you ever spent much time with his dad? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Nice guy. Yeah. And then I went to um, London for a while, and that's where I found this whole box of all this, you know, really great old stuff, like from like the you know, like from Virgin Records when it was a when it was a record store, and uh, and then I had I found these Process um, magazines. I think it was actually I think it was just called Process Magazine, but it was it it was uh, I'm sure you know all this, but I guess it was a magazine put out by uh, the the church and and uh, yeah, I, the Process yeah I mean, they they had thematic issues. One was sex. One was love. One was fear, one was death, and that was a subject of two Feral House books. Any positive stories, or you know, from from people that were members, did they come out and say? Yeah, you know? I heard a lot of positive stories about it. Yeah, there were uh, in the eighties. Uh, there was a a true crime, real hack job book called Ultimate Evil, I think that was the name of it. Huh. And they were trying to put out the idea that uh, Process Church was a, a super bloody satanic church that was killing people left and right. Hmm. And <laughs> yeah. uh, unfortunately for me, you know, that's a lot more provocative and... Um, that sells a lot of books. Too. Right. Uh, but the actual fact of the matter is that they, they weren't really that way. They were just sort of like it was a, a metaphysical cult that was run by a woman. That wasn't really known before I put out that Love, Six, Fear, Death book. It was a matriarchal cult run by a woman, and then this guy, Bob, wrote their protocols and um, magazine content and so on and so and it was interesting the perspective they had the perspective was kind of gnostic and all-inclusive of various uh, beliefs and it was more uh, psychologically uh, based on people's personality more union gnostic style material they weren't Going around like Son of Sam, and Son of Sam, oh, he claimed that it was part of the process. It was an easy thing to say because sure. these guys had provocative magazines yeah. with a lot of amazing-looking uh, art direction. And it was very punky almost, if punk was more elaborate in its uh, uh, technique and aesthetic. The thing is, is that, you know, it was a very interesting... Thing I had heard about the Process Church and the, uh, the apocalypse culture, I think, back in the 80s. But then I, you know, they were hard to find. Yeah. Hard to do a story on them. All the stories about them was this basic why. Like I found victorious in locating a lot of these original members and getting involved. Genesis Porridge, if uh, yeah. people know them from Throbbing Gristle. Right. With help 
in that too, introducing me to a couple of those guys. Now, didn't you guys do a? You did a, an actual public performance kind of thing with the process. Um, I mean, you had music and and slides and yeah. spoken word, I imagine. Oh, yeah. And um, yeah. That was that was important. It was in Portland, right? Or did you take it around? Uh, we did in Portland, Seattle, San Francisco, L.A., New York, Philadelphia. Yeah, I was really, I was really excited about that. I, I, fortunately, I had moved out of California. I really wanted to see that. Um, and I, it, it was funny too because when you were talking about the magazine, I do rem- I remember. Um, you know, there being celebrities in the magazines. Um, I think, um, I can't remember if it was, you know, it was, it was like some of the Rolling Stones were in there, and um, there were some models and stuff that were pretty famous in that time that were in the magazines. And I don't know if they were members or it was just that they did interviews. Uh, there was one time I was uh, talking with Whitley Strieber, the author, and uh, he had told me he was... He was a film student at the London International Film School, and he was trying to uh-huh. do, and he was trying to do a uh, documentary on the Process Church, and he had said that um, he somehow it had like the deal had turned bad or something, and the woman had these big giant dogs, and she sicked these dogs on him, and him and his friend had to climb up on the roof of this building. It was just so it was really dramatic, you know, that uh, you know these. Two young film students leaping from roof to roof, trying to escape, you know, the carnage of. Oh, I heard, so you hear stories like that. Yeah. And, and there, I mean, the real story is not as like dramatic in that TV series way, but they're far more interesting and far weirder. Yeah. Boy. And, and Whitley Strieber, he's a pulp writer. And so was that pulp writer who wrote that true crime book, The Ultimate Evil. And that's pulp. That's fiction. It was fiction. And uh, people like pulp. I don't blame them. It's interesting. Yeah. But it's it's very surface. It's not very investigative. It's not that interesting at base, really. You don't want to read it again. That's why people get by those mass market paperbacks, so they can throw them out after they finish it. It's like reading. It's like uh, looking at a Playboy magazine for a masturbatory element, to it, going back to that masturbatory <laughs> surface look thing. So that's what I do. I, I try to get beyond the surface. Yeah. And investigate much further, and have some substance to what we publish. That's the purpose of it. Well, I, you know, as an example of my bookshelf here, I imagine I imagine your books are the few books that people come over to someone's house say, "Hey, let me borrow that," and the person says, "Okay, you can borrow that," because I've had so many books, not of your book. I I would never loan a book of yours out, but. You know, but I've had I've loaned books out before and never got them back. So I think people that like the books from Feral House, I I think they probably have a low ratio of loaning books out to people. Because you know? because it is something. I mean, because I I can go and read this stuff over and over again, just like you said. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what Process Media does? What is different um, between that and Feral House? What's different is that I wanted to. When Feral House has a kind of a, a vibe to it that you know of, yeah, and that is immediately thought of as being dark and extreme and other stuff like that, I thought, well, somehow they people think it's a it's a type, and I want to get away from that type for a bit for some of the books I wanted to publish. Like for example, I have a book of the book. A series it's called the Self Reliance series under the Process Media imprint, okay. and what we do is uh, have a more accessible stuff on how to uh, how to keep alive and how to do things in a more uh, extreme thing, but not having it so extreme and unpleasant that people can't get something from it. It's more like 
uh, instruction on preparedness and getting away, you know, becoming a, a an, an alien. <laughs> and um, I mean, n- uh, non-American giving up citizenship <laughs> and how to do that. So they, it's you know, and there's a lot on uh, medical stuff and yeah. farming and other aspects that you know your usual middle class guy they should probably know about because it'd be important things to know but they're too intimidated by the usual book about it it's funny because uh i i got master of the mysteries i guess is that is that, a, is that was that one of process medias uh the, the yeah ma- that's manly hall yeah i am um... the, uh, the occultist and yeah i had no idea that was a process media book but um that's become one of my favorite books of of recent and i i've, I've found um you know this old archives of audio of of his uh his talks mm-hmm. and uh they're just some really great stuff i mean i i yeah i can play those at night and just go off and have a dream about you know stuff he's talking about but um the uh the gardening stuff is fantastic uh you i think you've got some uh, I don't want to say cookbooks, but like the raw magic and um, the raw cooking, and uh, and yeah. it, and I'm getting. In fact, today this is coincidence. Uh, I just received a, a a brand new juicer in the mail, so um, so I'll be. Hopefully, I, that's what I want to do. I want to grow our own food and juice it, and just try to be as sustainable. Oh, you, as you know this. I mean, you go into a supermarket, and eighty, ninety percent, it's just total shit yeah, absolutely. in the market. Mm-hmm. And, and it doesn't, it's not a healthy thing. No. And I, and, and it's hard not to think that, it that you know, somehow this all hasn't been planned to do this to us, you know. I mean, it's like, uh, you know, somehow we, we they, they kind of give us a blanket and we're kind of, they put blinders on us and then they, they make us sick with the food and, you know, and, you know, we have to do these jobs. I know my perspective is this, you know, we can think and dwell on why did this happen? Who's trying to control this? Yeah. What is it? But that's a distraction from the essential thing people need to do. People need to get it together and figure out how to best live on their own. Right. And not watch TV, not get lazy, investigate, get knowledgeable. You know, I mean, I I, I don't want to – that's another subject about that. You know, it's obviously it benefits uh, certain corporations to be shit heels and liars and destroy things. But that's another – subject but yeah. what people need to do is get together to be as healthy and knowledgeable as possible and i would say uh seek out this process media stuff because i'm looking at what you have you've got uh get your pitchfork on you've got uh getting out which yep. i believe you were talking about uh, about you know what it would take yeah. to leave america and all the the different steps you should probably take um i would imagine this version being uh so new there's probably a, just a ton of stuff that's completely different than any kind of book on the similar subject, you know, would have been, you know, in the past. Uh, and also, the, like this uh, urban, the modern utopian, um, it's something you know. Uh, I still, I grew up, you know, with the what was it the the new the what was it the whole Earth catalog or the new Earth catalog, and then Mother Earth News, which I, which I still get, you know, from time to time. But uh, yeah, I mean. I'm excited to see this stuff in uh, in your uh, mix of uh, or in your catalog because um, you know the urban homestead when uh, when there's no doctor. I mean these titles are just great. Um, and then there is yeah. and then you do have fun stuff. I mean you have you know you have stuff in there that isn't so doom and gloom, but as you say, it, it can get you off your butt and. Do something about your situation and yeah, not just I mean, sit around and complain about it like like everybody. Well, I that's the thing is if people are looking, this is what I was thinking. What I was, 
putting these books together, the people are intimidated by, oh, there's, I can't deal with it. It's just too much. Everything is going to fail. It's just like, it's just people give themselves an excuse not to do shit. Yeah. And I thought the, the process media was more uh, instigate a self-knowledge and self-help in a way that uh, better better for people, for the world, rather than just giving it up. Adam, if, if someone was to... What what is, is someone that, that that might hear this that had never experienced it before? Should they find you on? Should they find the process media, or they should should they find it on Facebook? Should they go to the the actual websites? What should, what do you think is the best introduction that someone could have? Well, they can well come to our websites, I guess. It's, yeah. Um, our websites like processmediainc.com, but you can look it up on uh, Google process media and then the other feral house of course yeah and that feral house is a you know bigger company with more titles than process media but been doing feral house since the late 80s and uh process media started in 2005 do you have any you know any film plans uh coming up anything that you want to do as a i mean would you consider do, putting documentaries out or anything like that um there's a you know there's been a documentary done on this commune called uh book that we published through process media called the source family hmm. and that got around pretty well and you can download it for a couple bucks on amazon it, it's really good video my ex-wife uh, did that and i assisted in a little bit with that and that's based on that process media book but there's the uh, book american hardcore that spun off that documentary about the you know hardcore punk days yeah and uh we have a there, there are always these people like i've made a deal with sundance channel on doing a television series based on um, the Sex and Rockets book, The Life of Jack Parsons. Wow, that'd be great. And, and then uh, there's a film I wrote called uh, Dallas and Wonderland. It's about the JFK assassination cover-up. And apparently, supposedly, uh, people are moving forward with that um, uh, script. And we'll see if it happens. I they say it is, so I don't know. Yeah, but Hollywood's a strange universe. And anything strange. can happen. Some guy wants to do something about Anton Bay. We have a revised edition of his uh, biography called Secret Life of a Satanist, and that's coming out again, and that's about the life of Anton LaVey, uh, the founder of the Church of Satan. And um, so, you know, the things happening all the time yeah and a lot of books at the printer right now that chemtrails book is one of them another book is uh, uh citizen keen which i'm doing i've done a expanded widely expanded with a lot of images from the uh news article news essay or uh, feature article i wrote and that's coming out soon and so you know i'm pretty busy yeah, I mean that's that's I mean that's great because I I not that it's been a short amount of time, but the volume of quality, you know, the volume and quality of work that you've been able to put out is has been spectacular. I I think you know if you stopped now, you know, it would still be, an, you know, more than enough for, you know, for a man's life. But um, but please don't stop, and thank you so much. I it's I love. Uh, I love reading your books, and I love, you know, seeing your posts on Facebook. And uh, hopefully, I'll get to meet you someday. And you've been a real inspiration. And I thank you for your work and your diligence in uncovering, you know, new and uh, you know, un unseen work. So, you know, so thank you very much. Thanks for being on the show. Well, well, thank you, Jerry, for those kind words. Appreciate it. All right. Have Thanks a good. Thanks for having me on. All right. Bye bye.